Yeah, welcome back um, here in the auditorium. Um, after this uh, slot we had before, which was uh, giving very um, strong insights into the policy of housing in Berlin, um, we are moving now to Latin America with two presentations, uh, one by Mariana Fix on uh, the situation of housing in Brazil, the other one by Lisa Schmidt, Colinet, Alexander Sch Schmöger, and Florian Seifang on the Cuban micro brigades. But we will start with Mariana, and it's a real pleasure to have you here, uh, not only for tonight, for the lecture, but also for the Wohnungsfrage Academy. And um, we look very much forward to hear more about the housing situation in Brazil, uh, mainly also because Brazil is, uh, I think, one of the most interesting fields for uh, housing policies, uh, one of the most extreme examples, I guess, including the famous, uh, sometimes also infamous program, um, Minha Vida, Minha Casa, as one of, uh, I think, well-known example, but uh, we are very keen on hearing more about the background. Mariana is a lecturer at the Institute of Economics at the University of Campinas, Unicamp, and author of books on uh, parkours of exclusion and uh, on Sao Paulo as a global city. She holds a PhD in economics from the University of Campinas, a master's in sociology from the University of Sao Paulo, and a professional degree in architecture and urbanism from the University of Sao Paulo. And in that respect, I think, uh, you represent, um, I think, some, some angles of our exhibitions also, uh, which somehow tries also to escape from some of the professional boundaries that also limit very much the discussion about housing. Mariana was a visiting research scholar at uh, CUNY in New York at the Graduate Center um, from 2012 till uh, 13. She's a member of the Housing and Human Settlements Laboratory at the School of Architecture and Urbanism at the University of Sao Paulo, and has been working with um, the Right to the City organizations um, for several years. Uh, please give a warm welcome to Mariana Fix. Uh, thank you very much for, for the introduction and for the invitation to be here. And thank you also, you all, for coming at this time. Um, my contribution today is meant to be a, a reaction on the concept proposed by the Housing System Academy, as published in, uh, in this book here. Ah, not in the beginning. So it should be like this. Uh, so my, the presentation I, I prepared today, my contribution today, is meant to be a reaction to the concept proposed by the Housing System Academy, as published in this book, and, and that you can see, uh, as I know, that not everyone is attending the Academy, so I just got this page so that you can get familiar with the concept of it. I will leave it for you to read. Uh, and uh, translations, uh, it, if translation can help also. Okay, so uh, I, my, my presentation be a, here is going to be a reaction to that. And in order to recognize the housing system and to see how it works in any of its parts, as the Academy curator suggested, I believe it's important to find connections among uh, fragmentary evidence, connections established by overwhelming forces of capitalist expansion throughout the continents, connections that are there to be found but are not easy to, easy to grasp. Since the curator suggested uh, we do study those evidences in, in rigorously and unconventional ways, my strategy today will be to make use of an interview made by Bloomberg with a financial 
uh, asset, uh, with asset manager uh, firm um, CEO, financial invest investor, who is specialized in opening new urban frontiers for capital. I will discuss how capital in its most abstract forms, such as finance, connects to, the, to housing production in its various concrete forms. More specifically, I will highlight the pressure exerted, exerted by capital during finance-led globalization to connect with, with local housing production system uh, circuits, aiming at expand itself in cities from the 19th onwards. The main question, inspired by the housing after the neoliberal turn uh, book, which, is being, which was launched here as well, so the main question addressed will be, has capital redefined the housing question as part of new liberal turn? I fraction the interview you are about to watch into seven very, very short segments, and I will make a comment at the end of some of them. In each comment, I will include elements of the research I've been conducting on this theme for a, for a long time. So besides Brazil, China, Mexico, Chile, India, the US, and some other countries will be mentioned here, although not examined in the same level of detail, of course. At the very end, I will add a comment about one important aspect that by no chance, uh, by, uh, not by chance, is not going to be mentioned during this interview. So what I did was really segmenting it so that we can uh, we can uh, comment uh, uh, right after something that uh, some part of it that I think uh, it's important to to discuss and is going to to lead us to some. Uh uh, the world, according to these two gentlemen. Uh, sorry, can you can you hear it? Is it uh okay? Sorry. Uh, here is not very loud. In just a few moments, you're going to hear from the man who partnered with Zell to enter Brazilian real estate when they both formed Equity International back in 1999. He's Gary Garibrand. Now, uh, the world, according to these two gentlemen, goes like this. China and Brazil are the core of their outlook for housing growth. Both have an enormous rising middle class and a developing mortgage market. But what's got Gary traveling around the world these days is exploring the frontier markets, places like Colombia, Vietnam, India, Russia. They form the tip of their next big investments. And Gary, of course, is with me right now. He is the CEO of Equity International. And Gary, uh, are you getting any sleep these days or what? Very little. Do you know it where you are? Shows. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You just recently stepped down as the chairman of Gafisa, right, yes. which is, I think is the third largest Brazilian home builder. Yes, and the only New York Stock Exchange listed. Okay. Uh, why did you step down? Well, in our uh, pattern, we build companies. Uh, we invested in Gafisa as a private company. Uh, built the company into a the first national Brazilian home builder. Mm -hmm. uh, took the company public locally, Bovespa, a year later, New York Stock Exchange. Right. Uh, built a, a terrific management team, um, strong governance, independent board. Uh, okay, et and that's your pattern with that's these companies. That's our pattern. Okay. Yeah. And so it was time. And you've done the same with Chinese companies as well, right? We have, and okay. maybe before that, even more to the point, Homex in Mexico okay. uh, also followed this pattern. Okay, so China, Mexico, and Brazil here uh, as, as some of the new frontiers. In this first except, uh, we, uh, there is a very interesting uh, discussion for us to make. How does finance capital enter local real estate or property markets? What are the consequences? As we heard, the interview opened an asset management company to partner with local home builders. That's something quite different from internationalization as it happens before and in other branches of the economy, such as food or home appliances or uh, any other sector. Equity International bought part of a traditional local home builder called Gafisa, while it was still a private company in a sh uh, and did that in a very short-term strategy to obtain high profits. They changed the company management system according to the so-called corporate governance standard and took the company public, first listing it at Bovespa, Sao Paulo Stock Exchange, and a year, a year later in the New York Stock Exchange. By doing so, they connected the firm with shareholders' return expectation 
change the temporality of wealth accumulation. Com company decisions had to deal uh, with that from then on. Public traded companies are not something new in capitalism at all. John Hobson has discussed this long ago in his study, Evolution of Modern Capitalism. Nevertheless, it, it was not frequent for the um, real estate sector in many countries, including uh, the US, in which I, I also did some research. Besides, since we are talking about home builders and developers, this change had some important consequences for cities, landscape, and architecture, as we will see. The process of going public with share traders traded on stock markets is the entry door for foreign investors who can obtain gains and then leave the country at any time in search of other lucrative opportunities. To operate in this way, they need the shares to be easily traded without losing value. That's to say, they need the assets to, to have liquidity. They also expect the shares to give good returns compared to other assets. We are in the phase of new connections between different scales and also a new temporality, as I have stressed. This is not a simple mission, give this kind of uh, high return and short term in this uh, kind of sector, such as construction, which is very labor intensive, at least in countries like Brazil, Mexico, as he was saying. Uh, and uh, less speculation is not an accident in that. Uh, the re what research shows is it's the very central aspect of this business for very, very concrete reasons. Profit obtained in construction sites with low wages and long working days are often combined with land rent extraction. One example of, of this is the housing developments located far from the city center, often in rural lands, then converted into urban lands. I got just one example. There are several of them. We are going to see it later. I will try to connect this discussion of finance capital and the space and the territoriality. So this is one of kind of investments we are talking about, not specifically by this company, just, just because this shows easily that it's so far from the city center and it, it, you can easily see the, 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 the settlement up there, just to uh, stress that, uh, la that this kind of uh, gains obtained uh, with land uh, speculation, buying them uh, at cheap price and then selling high, is very important, a structural part of this business, and this has important consequences. Uh, we are going to listen a little bit more from, oh, the, so this is the, the kind of so does this, your stepping down at Gavisa, does that signal a turning point for your investments in that country? No, not at all. Our enthusiasm remains uh, at the highest level. Uh, we love the housing sector. The demand, unmet demand for housing remains over 7 million units. Uh, household formation is outpacing house production mm -hmm. by a wide margin, okay. uh, which means that there's going to be this gap uh, that continues to grow over the next 10 to 15 years. So uh, in Gafisa case, we know that Equity International, the asset management firm, uh, that he partnered with Samzel. I don't know if uh, how many of you are familiar with Samzel, a very famous American uh, investor. Uh, he, so in, this, in case of Gafisa, we know that Equity International progressively decreased its shares over the years, going from 24% of the, of the stocks in, 20, in 2006 to 11 and then 7.5 in 2010. And then we can ask, uh, as, as she did, does that mean that he, they, they got disappointed with the gains and they, that's why they went out of uh, the company? And as you can see, it's quite the opposite. As explained uh, by the respondent, it's a strategy. It's their pattern, as he says. And what's this pattern about? the pattern of obtaining large short-term gains. And uh, the thing is that this kind of, of uh, strategy uh, is very short-term, but the consequences on urban uh, landscapes are long-term. Uh, the interview mentions that the same uh, kind of pattern was followed in uh, Mexico with a company called Homex and similar, something sim similar in China. So I, I prepared this slide just for 
uh, to take a look, uh, you have like four different and uh, what's important local companies, and uh, that uh, they, they, it's very different kind of internationalization from uh, like uh, what we had in Brazil, automobiles company coming in, uh, like many multinationals. What we had is this kind of finance capital coming in uh, through uh, this process of opening up of the companies. It's noteworthy that we are, there are at least uh, two investment patterns, these which is called private equity, when they buy a, like a large amount of the company, really transform the way it behaves, its strategy, its logics, where it builds, how it builds, and so on, and then tr uh, go away, obtaining very high profits in short term. And there is another, uh, the, another pattern, if you want to use uh, this term, which is have a, have a small share of many different countries so that the, you can easily go uh, away without, uh, without losing money and without establishing strong uh, links with the territory and, and the companies. But as I said, uh, you establish new, the companies then have new para parameters and they, they impose that somehow in, in the cities. Something more? used to grow over the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, I want to bring up, and I think we have this graphic f uh, for our viewers, which essentially shows the housing deficit. You yes. mentioned the housing, uh, the unmet demand, but there's yes. a housing deficit uh, statistics that we that you that you guys have provided us, which show that Brazil, if we have it up at 17.9 million uh, in Brazil, you have Vietnam 20 million housing yes. deficit, yeah. uh, and then you go on and on with Peru 2 million there. So when you look at that, though, uh, does that tell you that with Vietnam with 20 million, does that mean that that's your biggest market? No, I, that's a little misleading, I think, okay. uh, statistically, that it may be true. However, other factors come into play. Uh, affordability, access to mortgage capital. Uh, Vietnam has yet to establish a sustainable mortgage system uh, compared to, say, a Mexico or a Brazil. Uh, we see Colombia actually is, is probably next uh, to, create such, yeah, to create such a system. Uh, Colombia is a country of 45 million people, uh, that's about half of Vietnam, and yet, uh, in our view, it's positioned to respond more uh, quickly uh, in a housing context. This is one of the parts I think it's more interesting when you see that map and discussing like this kind of uh, strategies or to move around. And uh, it's, inter it's interesting to discuss exactly this, the interview, look at the, what so, the so-called housing deaths and say, oh, so you, you can tell that the next country you're going to go is Vietnam. And he, he says this, that's a little misleading. And uh, statistically, it may be true. Uh, why is it he's a little bit embarrassed? Because this kind of attracting investors is usually uh, something that's advertised in the countries or something that's going to, uh, to be good to face the housing deficit. So many of the transformations that have been done is uh, with that uh, allegation. And what the, he said, there is, a difference, there is a difference between demand and deficit. And that's, that's a long discussion. I'm not going into details, but I think it's very important. So the so-called housing deficit in peripheral countries, the so-called emerging economies, a term that I, I don't like very much, so uh, peripheral countries, I mean uh, Brazil, Mexico, and Colombia, for instance, cannot be, uh, the so-called housing deficit cannot be considered a housing market, at least not automatically. It does not necessarily mean housing demand in economic terms. That's the reason why Mr. Garaband considered other countries more interested to invest than Vietnam. Uh, how is housing deaths converted into demand? First of all, we have to acknowledge that a huge mass of urge wage earnings Latin Americans are not included in the capitalist housing production market. The majority of the population is forced to resort to informal expedients of housing and siege production, such as slums and tenements, so outside the so-called housing market. The housing solution, uh, between brackets, as seen in residence self-building, viewed uh, as, ma as marginal and backward by many, in fact, has been has proved to be an aspect of Latin America conservative modernization that relied on lowering the reproduction cost of labor power. Rent inequality is so high that real estate housing production has historically been restricted to the richest stratum of population. The sector is also territory, territorially very much segmented. 
Com companies used to specialize in particular cities, the economically most dynamic, and even in parts of those cities due to the social spatial segregation. It's important to remember that we are talking about a country, in the case of Brazil and some others, of continental dimensions and unequal uh, regions. So I, I got some uh, of the images for us to realize some of characteristics of, uh, of, of this that uh, helps us to understand this pattern of uh, how capital comes into real estate. This is uh, just to show the, the, uh, how the, the real estate market uh, was, uh, in most of the history, this, this is kind of extreme, very luxury. We have less uh, apartments that are not as large as that, but this is just to, co to contrast with uh, this uh, Minha Casa Minha Vida. I know that you know it's in Portuguese, but for those who know it, it's kind of my home, my life plan, which is a housing, the most important now housing program, very controversial. And so the, I, the, my home, my life, just my casa, my vida, this is one apartment of it, just to contrast with this luxury apartment. This is the made, uh, the workers' room, and uh, for three different uh, maids living inside this, this big uh, apartment, and it's in the same uh, scale, so that you can have an idea of what we are talking about when, we, when you say that this is very important to understand uh, the housing, uh, the real, real estate market. This is just to show the differences uh, regionally in, uh, in Brazil, which is something to be considered very different from other, from other countries, large as, the, as Brazil, but not so much unequal regionally considering the house adequacies, the relative housing debt. Uh, this is kind of the main uh, business district uh, in Sao Paulo metropolis to give an idea of uh, the, the richest areas of, of uh, Sao Paulo. This is a famous picture of, uh, that shows the inequality. And this is to, to show the differences, the, the just kind of very segmented the market. Uh, sorry. Uh, in which you have the formal real estate market and the so-called informal land market uh, with uh, this one uh, and uh, in the water reservatory protected area, tenements, slums. This is uh, housing projects from the 60s. This is squatting, uh, building, and, uh, and this is the most uh, common uh, middle class uh, kind of buildings. And this is also something that shows uh, how inequality, we, we were talking about inequality here earlier with Heyhood Martin and people from Bio Center, uh, Jacob and Susan, and here we, we see that uh, how inequality is produced and reproduced all the time since uh, the very beginning of, uh, of uh, urbanization in Brazil. And it's very hard for workers, for the majority of population, to have access to legal land. And when they manage to get in a, in a slum, but uh, that slum near the business center, near the place where they work, uh, you, uh, when it gets interesting for real estate, they get evicted in this kind of very violent way. And this is a case I studied a long time ago and in which I showed that um, many of them went to leave, went from one slum to the other near the business center and near the water reservoir environmental protected area. Uh, so let's hear a little bit. A lot of people talk about the bubble in China, mm -hmm. housing bubble. Yeah. Well, I think it's, uh, again, we'll go back to the government influence uh, okay. on uh, capital flows and the government's influence over the banks and providing capital to both corporate and uh, But you don't private. buy into it, though? Well, I, at, from time to time. Okay. Uh, I think there are bubbles that get created. We see it. Uh, our home builders uh, are very sensitive to the cost of land. Right. The economics have to work right. uh, for our uh, communities to work. And from time to time, there's too much capital in the system. Uh, which you know explodes prices. Uh, people who shouldn't be competing with us are, are competing in. with us, and then they recede as the government pulls back. Uh, Gary, really quickly. Uh
You were intrigued by what kind of people shouldn't be competing with us, but let's... <laughs> Uh, so, uh, here I think we have two very important things to comment on. First of all, of course, the importance of national state. Anything that has been done wi was without the national state. There was no such a thing as a withdrawal of national state. There is a, n a change in the nature, perhaps, but it's a different narrative from what I think you have here in Europe and from what you have in the US about the neoliberal turn. That's something, of course, we won't have time to discuss, but I'd like to, to, to let this for perhaps later or during the academy. Uh, the, the second important thing I, I, I would like to stress uh, uh, th is that uh, when they enter Brazil, it doesn't mean that they bought, if, if, if I think I told you, they bought part of the companies, uh, very seldom the whole uh, company. They don't want to take control of the building construction. They don't want to deal with workers. They don't want to be in the country for a long term. So this kind of strategy is partnered with Brazilian former owners. And who are Brazilian former owners? The, the real estate was kind of arbit reserved for national elites, and that was for a long time family owned business. And I, I, in many cases, it's still like that. There are many companies that are still totally uh, owned uh, by Brazilian um, elites. And, but some of them got this combination, and I've been uh, studying these kind of companies in, in very great deal of detail and following what has happened, what kind of money came into them, what kind of changes this, uh, and so this kind of connections I, I was talking about in the beginning that relates, I think, with the concept of an academy of trying to find and map the connections between this, so this uh, apparently fragmentary evidences. So, um, the, if, uh, as I was saying, we can't understand that if you don't take a look at uh, how uh, the government acts. And uh, we, with the policies launched by Brazilian Ministry of Sieges in 2003, it's very much a, uh, uh, a difficult top to talk very fast because it's kind of, it's first time that uh, Lula was the president, it's the Labour Party, there were lots of expectations of how things would happen. And what really happened in this area is that uh, there was a restructuring of the credit system with this idea of enlarging the formal market. As I said, it was only restricted to the top of Brazilian pyramid uh, of rent, like 20% of the population, most 30% had access to formal real estate land. So this was this idea that seemed progressive, that you could enlarge that so that the state uh, could concentrate its subsidies and its production in, in the lower, really, the people who really did it. But what happened is that when the credit was restructured, they fed uh, a kind of uh, company that got lots of power, uh, even power to impose the model of the new housing policy. I'm going a, a little bit fast on that, but that's to say that in 2008, when you had the financial crisis, developers went through a sharp drop in uh, they, they, a, a few years before, so the credit was restructured, companies got more money, they opened up, they went to the public, uh, they, they become public, as you say in English, so they were public trade in the stock market, and, uh, and they were very successful in that in the beginning, and so it was kind of new thing. But in 2008, they were also, the, the value of the companies went really, really down, and the response, the answer for it was this kind of association of partnering with the government to launch this new housing program called uh, Minha Casa Minha Vida. Uh, this program, it's very important to know, it's funded by a combination of public and semi-public funds, uh, federal public resources, and an important fund uh, that is uh, from the workers, and also saving and lowers funds. Real estate circuit is not as self-sufficient self -sufficient as it sometimes seems to be. The housing debt, the housing shortage, used to justify the grabbing of public funds and thus creates the apparent possibility of reconciliation of capital and workers' interest. They seem to be aligned the fight for housing short against the housing shortage, but only until contradictions manifest. 
Never, the result of instructing companies to meet the so-called housing shortage was, has been a very a productivist model to build housing, location, typology, job site, and architectural design mainly determined by developers within parameters of their profit forecasts and combined with expectations of rentier gains land rent capture, and stock market appreciation. So there was this new combination of land rent capture, which is kind of old in Brazil, and stock market appreciation. We can see it uh, on uh, this program on page 111 on the book that has been produced for this academy. And uh, I show it, this book, uh, I have a, a chapter on that that tells more about uh, this program if you are interested. And this is the page of the, of the book, was not made by me, was uh, organized uh, by the authors of the, of the Atlas. And I just made a few more examples, put another, this one I done, uh, I'm going to use it in the, in the, during the academy, this kind of, uh, many others like this. And so here we have some idea, I wanted you to have this idea that it's not about uh, this kind of, that I showed in the beginning, but they have other kinds of typology. Um, and uh, as uh, I don't know if you noticed that Gary Garaban said, it's not just about having a housing, huge housing debt that makes it interesting, that makes it a housing market. What makes it a housing market? And then he starts saying what are the conditions for them to come. And one of them is feeding the aspiration of young people. And this you can see, this is the, slogan, the, the logo of the program. And this is the website of a developer. So it's this kind of combination. Do you ever get any resistance from governments to developing a mortgage market at all? Uh, to the contrary. Uh, this is, uh, falls into the uh, long-term positive infrastructure uh, for con countries uh, uh, creating uh, a middle class uh, you know, drawing on, uh, feeding the aspiration mm -hmm. of uh, young people uh, is, is a very good thing. Okay. Uh, we have yet to meet a government, uh, frankly, uh, and we don't... You mean uh, even after seeing what's happened here in the U.S., you never get any pause? Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> right? oh, you know, I think we've got a good 20 years uh, <laughs> right. before uh, we get to before the stage. Before things get screwy yeah, before, down there. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure they will, but it'll be some time. I know you guys travel sometimes, right, to these countries. We do. What was the last one that you and Sam visited? Uh, we were in Brazil for okay. a week, uh, visiting various partners, uh, both current and prospective. All right. Um, China is another one of your core. So uh, uh, you see that on the country, no, you don't have any resistance, even, and then she asked, even after seeing what happened here in the U.S., and of course, you know, the, all the, the foreclosures and so on, and there are some uh, interesting stories to, that I could tell you about that, but uh, I won't... Um, have time about how how people came and to advertise the housing bubble how that should be followed in Brazil. So let's keep to the script here. One of the attempts to open Brazil for circulation of finance capital was to create a mortgage system inspired by the U.S. model. In 1995, for instance, a committee formed by representatives of the private and public financial systems, the central bank, the Ministry of Finance, and many businessmen, businessmen traveled to the U.S. to be introdu introduced to the American financing model centered on securitization. The American real estate bubble was presented in Brazil as something to be mimic, even though there were signs of its devastating possible effects confirmed by the 2008 crisis with the foreclosure in the U.S., Spain, Portugal, and many other countries. Differently from the U.S., however, where financialization transformed a mortgage system that has been structured since in the, in the 30s, in Brazil, financialization changed the real estate circuit only partially, and the real estate circuit is still under the effects of the interruption of credit system developments during the debt crisis that hit Latin America very hardly in, in the 80s. So it's, it's kind of semi-logic, but evolving in, in a different way. By the late 90s, the creation of real estate funding system in Brazil relied on the defense of a deregulated real estate financing system in opposition to the still existing funding system, which, is, which regulated the interest rate and captured the allocation of resources. 
here you can see how it works. It is, this is something that you, this is the thing that funds all the, this kind of, uh, of housing that you saw, and this is supposedly the modern way, the more like a mortgage-backed security system way. Uh, what happens is that the North American Mortgage Securitization System uh, was chosen as a model for Brazil for its supposedly ability to provide financial liquidity for operations and for, between brackets, not having any dependence on direct fund or mandatory targeting of resources. However, in order to establish itself, the new funding system used and it still uses public funds to leverage resources. Once again, the discourse of flexibility, the regulation, the new liberal discourse, to make it short, uh, the minimal state, was concealing a new way uh, to capture public funds. China is another one of your core markets, yes. and a lot of people talk about the rising middle class in yes. China. Is it as big an opportunity as some are saying it is? Yes, we believe it is. Uh, China is vast. You know this uh, in population terms and land uh, area terms. Uh, the uh, amount of progress that's been made uh, mm -hmm. in such a short period of time is astounding. Uh, but how you know, would you compare China to Brazil? Well, uh, it's very different. I mean, the people are very different. We're in the partnering business. Mm -hmm. uh, we have found amazing partners in Brazil mm. uh, in terms of their, uh, their want to learn right. uh, and to build uh, serious companies alongside uh, with uh, and for our in Brazil. Yeah, They're, in Brazil. In what China, about China? Uh, the first generation entrepreneurs are different, uh, more challenging. Okay. Uh, they are uh, much more patriarchal, uh, one foot in communism. Uh, and one foot in capitalism. Yes, and, and struggling a bit with uh, that. I'm glad you mentioned that, Gary, because I do want to roll, because your, your partner, Sam Zell, had, was a bit more direct okay. uh, in saying this, uh, and this is what he told me at that, okay. at that forum. At this particular stage in China's evolution, um, if you go look at these guys who have got these companies up to this point, mm -hmm. um, they're basically tyrants. Tyrants? Yes, well, that, <laughs> is, uh, that would be a descriptor. Uh, bullies would be another. Uh, and we're collaborators, uh, and we're building organizations. And so we're working tirelessly with these guys. Right. Uh, to build terrific companies, uh, and it is a struggle, no So no it's question. more difficult to deal for, with these companies. For certain. Uh, at the same time, uh, the opportunity is vast, uh, and we are eternal optimists, and we look ahead to the next generation, right. uh, assuming we, we get there ourselves. <laughs> right. uh, the next generation of entrepreneurs are much more worldly okay. and sophisticated. And, right. and we're very excited about that. Right. I know you have one uh, or several Chinese companies you've invested in. One yeah. is um, Xin Yuan, Xin Yuan. Uh, which uh, I think is one of the first ones that you yes. invested in. Yes. Okay. Yeah, as a home builder, and Jin Ray, another privately held. Xin okay. Yuan being public, uh, publicly traded. Right. And Yupei, which is a privately held log logistics A lot of people talk about. So, uh, so uh, you see uh, this generation of China, Chinese entrepreneurs has to die to, to you know, other two things to do. But anyway, I, I, I hear I want to make many comments just to show that uh, there's very interesting question raised about similarities and uh, differences between countries like China and Brazil that sometimes are put together. And, uh, and you see uh, that is obvious a very different uh, insertion in, in capitalism and very different relation towards the U.S. And that makes a lot of difference uh, uh, that's important to be considered when you try to map a housing, something like a housing system. And the last uh, short video government pulls back. Uh, Gary, really quickly, um, what is the one market that you would like to be in that is just not ready yet? Well, uh, India is, is a market uh, that falls into this category. We are intrigued with India, and yet uh, the uh, institutionalized corruption, mm -hmm. bureaucracy, uh, and our uh, to-date inability to find a partner uh, committed to the highest standards, as are we, has uh, has thwarted our efforts in India. Really? Uh, we you don't mean, have so enough time to tell all the stories, but you know it's a challenging <laughs> right. place. So you've uh, talked to people, but you just haven't oh, been able to, to seal the deal at oh, all. Oh, yeah. We've okay. traveled there a number of times and continue to look. Gary, thank you so much. I don't know where you're headed next, but is it in another exotic location? or Back to Brazil on Monday. Back to Brazil. <laughs> all right. <laughs> 
Okay, the, the next exotic location is going to be Brazil. Uh, so th that's the last, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, I would raise just a last uh, issue that was not mentioned, of course, in the interview, since uh, working labor is not considered. So it's a short comment on that. This is labor for Minha Casa Minha Vida. And those, so what we see is those who own the money uh, transfer the management of their savings to finance experts and depend on, on their criteria to obtain profits. As an, as asset management companies are managers of this kind of collective financial funds, many of them are workers' funds. For each single investor, money appears to be an object that produces value for itself, money generating money as if it had nothing to do with the construction site. But the sophisticated and abstract forms of financialization continue to be combined with the extraction of absolute and relative surplus value at the construction site. Uh, there are, uh, in, the, in this area, Brazil is also well known uh, for the experiences of um, what we call the mutirão, which try to challenge this, this kind of uh, violence in, in the construction site. But I want to uh, comment that today we will leave that for the discussions during the, the academy. So, uh, as we have seen, by researching to an interview with a CEO of a global asset management firm, I don't mean that transformations come from abroad in a one-way process, as it might appear at first sight. I also don't mean that finance capital management managed to command the whole process on its own terms. On the contrary, I highlighted the role of national states and local elites, their coalition, co coalition and conflicts between different fractions of capital, the struggle between workers and capital, the connections between formal real estate production, housing policies, state subsidized, subsidized projects, and self-construction of the so-called informal settlement. As I mentioned, I do believe that the connections are there to be found and mapped. Uh, new kinds of housing policies, investments, credit systems, architecture typologies, urban forms and, and ideologies, though partially inspired by the same ideas or model in other countries, overlap very different social, political, and institutional structures, as well as distinct patterns of accumulation feeding local circuits that are more or less internationally articulated. So what I've tried to do is show you some, uh, some evidences of, of this. I try to discuss the obstacles that finance capital encounters in Brazilian cities and how it tries to overcome or circumvent those bar barriers. Urban land property and therefore cities seem to be under pressure to be treated as pure financial asset and reduce it to an open field for circulation of interest bidding capital since the creation of land markets. Uh, since this is an open event, I will take the liberty to conclude very quickly only with a set of uh, questions that uh, uh, I've been addressing during my research that are the foundation of the discussion I propose today. I just uh, put it there very fast. Uh, what are the specific ways this happen under finance-led globalization? How does this process unfold, unfold in different countries and social formations? Are we in the face of a globalized housing system or in the sum of regional and national circuits? How can we map the connections and articulation between different systems? Does the influence of international organizations such as World Bank leads to standardization of housing system, reducing local specificities? How can we identify local and global hegemonies? What's the importance and place of practice of self-construction of slums and tenements in each subsystem political economy? What kind of resistance and alternatives have been tested? Part of the answers, at least as far as I could uh, reach, I have addressed in my speech. They also can be for found perhaps more decisively in everyday practice of those facing this logic. Uh, in practice in most various ways. The remainder is to be worked out together by those interested in this challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana, for this um, incredible insight into um, not only the Brazilian situation, but uh, into the interconnections uh, on a global scale and uh, 
what I found really interesting is um, very often in, in discussions about housing, uh, you see a certain dichotomy between uh, informal and formal housing, which seemed to me also in the meantime quite an unproductive dichotomy mm -hmm. sometimes. And uh, I think you made clear that uh, how f the formalization of, an, of a market, of a housing market, is driven by very different parameters. Some local politics, local elites, plus uh, a, um, a kind of asset-driven um, global economy. Um, I still wonder what are the ways out of that, to me, unproductive dichotomy between formal and informal without maybe romanticizing the informal? Mm -hmm. No, I, I think uh, in Brazil, uh, informal is very hard, uh, it's, not, it's not romanticized at all because people know the, the violence that puts to everyday life, the, the time that people take to get to the, to the work, the precarity of the city and so on. And, uh, but, uh, and, and, and disconnections, the, the, the point you made is very important because disconnections between formal and, inf and informal was a very important discussion in Brazil and I think it shows for us some of the connections of housing as a global system, not only thinking of housing itself, the production of housing, but thinking how as being informal, as workers having to build their own houses, they are in a way uh, putting down uh, their, uh, their wages, uh, and this has a connection with uh, like uh, the global economy. Mm. And so this kind of uh, so-called uh, backwards and separate and something that is completely separated from the economy, in fact, is, very, is a structural part of the Brazilian uh, economy and, and in many other countries. And that puts housing in a def very different position uh, from, uh, mm. from other countries. You have this kind of, uh, some, someone called in Brazil, uh, Lucio Covarica, it's kind of dispoliation, you know, similar to what Harvey called uh, accumulation by dispossession that uh, here is kind of associated with neoliberalism. Mm. That is a structure and it is throughout uh, mm. all our history. Housing has always been a kind of important issue. Mm. Are, they, are there any questions from the audience? I hardly see any fingers coming up. Oh, there's there some. There. Yeah. One there. Hi. Hi. Um, thanks for your presentation. Uh, I'd like to ask a question with regard to um, the bubble and the bubble that was talked about in the interview. Um, you demonstrated how the the Brazilian housing market got integrated into um, global circuits of uh, finance, and um, you mentioned that uh, somehow the, or in the interview it was mentioned that um, the U.S. housing market and um, the finance system there led um, served as an example for Brazil in at least in some sense. Um, does that mean that um, Brazil is going to head towards um, housing bubble as well? And uh, if yes, when, is, when does it come? <laughs> or is the current crisis, economic crisis in Brazil already a manifestation of that? You were interested in investing there. <laughs> no, I'm joking. It's, uh, because, uh, it's um, yeah, th that's an important discussion being held over there because we do have a very high appreciation of land uh, real estate as we saw here this afternoon. We also in Brazilian cities have this increase, I, I didn't, choose that slide, but I do have it, which shows an increase in land prices and in real estate. So people start to think, is this is a bubble? It's not. Is it similar to what happened in the U.S.? Or, or, or it's not. And what we, we can see that uh, uh, this land appreciation is, is, is of a very is slightly different or perhaps very different uh, nature compared to that uh, from the U.S. So we, w we don't have a bubble in the same sense that we have in the, in the US. We did have many people investing in, um, in, uh, in real estate. We did have competition among uh, home builders, this kind of home builders that when they went public, they started to buy lots of lands. And it's interesting that be, it's because they wanted to show that they're, they're, to their shareholders that they could build a lot and they, then they bought land. So it's kind of connections between the, the two things. 
But uh, you see, it's different uh, from securitization, that's what I mean. Because uh, securitization is not important in Brazil, it's still not important. It was advertised a lot. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, they were there, World Bank has been trying to push it, and uh, they have been trying to teach uh, developers that uh, that would be interesting. But for now, what has happened uh, is that uh, it has been used much more as a discursive um, uh, uh, allegation in order to change the system, in order to uh, take restrictions for real estate and let them uh, play in their own uh, terms. So, so yes, we, we do have like a appreciation. If we have, uh, and now we, we do have a crisis, prices too are not that low. It's not the same uh, kind of uh, temporality of that. What I try to show is, is that financial capital did enter Brazil, but in a different way and, uh, and to a different extent. And part of it has already uh, withdrawn, which is kind of nature of, of this kind of financialized uh, system. Yeah. I think that there was another question over there. It, yeah, the two, yeah. one yeah. very far away. Yeah, maybe one last question. Um, I was wondering if you could make a few comments about this rising middle class because it kept occurring in um, in the discussions, and I was wondering. Yeah, that, that's uh, that's uh, an issue that has been uh, under discussion in Brazil a lot. The, uh, this was a characteristic what what some uh, scientists, the uh, social scientists, call the lulismo. It's a way of. Uh, to, to describe the kind of pact that happened uh, in, with the workers' party and business people, some, some kind of that, in which you had some kind of uh, rent distribution, and so people start saying, you have a middle, middle class, and, uh, but it's very controversial. Other people, what they will say is that there was, if you really look into the data, what you learn that we didn't have very important uh, wealth distribution, uh, if you cons the, the distribution we had, and that led to this idea that we have a new middle class in Brazil, it was a distribution only between uh, wage earners, uh, only with between workers themselves. And, but if you compare capital and labor, which is the real uh, uh, wealth distribution that uh, people expected to happen, uh, it, it, it didn't. So then uh, there is an, uh, an economist that says this kind of myth of, uh, of having a new middle class. But we did have some people that uh, got access to housing that were not in the housing market, that they have access to supplies, to many things that they didn't have. E and you had a model uh, that lasted uh, for many years and now is, is, is under attack and uh, it's in, uh, in crisis. But uh, we can talk about it perhaps more later. Yeah, I think we... Um, there is one, uh, uh, okay, one uh, last question. Um, yeah, hi. I um, was interested in what you mentioned about uh, this paradox of the person who is working in, in those uh, big construction sites, but at the same time doesn't have access to those housing uh, possibilities. And so, for instance, they are part of this uh, urban, uh, informal urbanism. And I was wondering if is that, like the auto construction, can be seen as an alternative to, to, to this lack of housing? It, it is uh, the, the only alternative, the vast amount of population Fine, but uh, uh, there is two kinds. When we talk about self-construction, auto-construction, it's in Portuguese, it's auto-construção. Uh, uh, there are two kinds of it in, in the debate. Uh, one is it uh, people who have low ages and they, they, they can't have access to a good house, and they can't uh, buy a house, they can't rent a house, they can't get into any kind of public uh, housing program. And then in the weekends, they themselves build their homes with the help of their families and their friends, or sometimes they hire uh, someone. And this is, is the precarity I was talking about. That it's very interesting for the, for the capitalist class, but it's not, it's not good for, for the workers themselves necessarily. And the other one is 
uh, some attempts that, uh, that were very important in Latin American history of uh, doing uh, this kind of what we call mutirão. It's not easily translated uh, into, into English, but uh, which, which means that you have uh, social movements that organize themselves usually with support from architects and other people. Uh, Carolina, who is here, uh, works with that. Uh, perhaps she can tell you more about that during the week. I was going to show a short movie on it, uh, but I didn't have time. And uh, this is something completely different. This is to challenge the hierarchy in the construction site. This is to challenge the hegemonic way housing uh, is production, is to challenge the size of the house. Uh, the, 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 there is a kind of participatory uh, way of designing, and uh, it, it, it does it, it in, in a different way. That's not to say that it resolves anything, that it changes completely, but that anyhow, it uh, is important into stimulating all the possibilities of, uh, of building and organizing a city and and so on. And uh, so it's not only the workers. Uh, it, the, the thing is that uh, construction is, uh, is, is in, in construction, especially in construction, the wages are really low. So sometimes uh, they advertise a program like that. You build a lot, and then you have to, you're going to have a job. But what construction uh, sector does is also what we call to recreate the, the urban tragedy in the sense that then the workers themselves have to to build new informal settlements. I think I won't have more time than that. <laughs> no, wonderful. Thank you so much, Mariana. Thank you. Uh, for this insight.